Thank you, uh, Zach Clever, Bar Harbor. Um, acidification is one of the issues that's affecting the oceans around the world the most. Uh, it's one of the biggest issues. Is this something that um, is on your radar that you're interested in, the impact of climate change and excess carbon in the oceans? Um, it's on my radar. I mean, yes, it's on, on, it's on the department's radar. Um, what can we do about it is obviously the big question. Uh, at a more, more smaller scale, we dealt with acidification in salmon rivers. Um, and it's been dealt with in many different ways um, and, uh, over the years in different areas. Um, from direct lining the rivers in Norway, they actually dump lime in the rivers to neutralize them and improve them for salmon habitat. I don't think we're going to stop lime in the oceans anytime soon. Uh, but the, the Congress, there's a lot more information that's obviously needed, so we have a better understanding of, uh, of acidification as, as well as the issues surrounding climate change. Uh, and those issues are being looked at, they're being looked at more, more focused, look, uh, looking at it through, uh, through NOAA fisheries, uh, and we'll continue to be um, uh, engaged in those conversations. I'm uh, Richard Nelson from Friendship. I'm just wondering how you're going to, uh, how the department's going to face these uh, new proposals as far as offshore wind energy and uh, ocean renewable energy in, uh, in general. Yes. We have that one proposal now. It, it's, it seems like under George's uh, tenure here that he became put in a situation of almost having to consider uh, offshore energy as a marine resource that he had to, to, to cope with. But, and from the fisherman's point of view, we'd rather to see you representing us as, as representing our loss of territory or things like that. I'm just interested in your thoughts about that. Yeah, it's obviously a big issue, and it's going to be a session on, on wind power. Uh, I think it's tomorrow. Um, uh, there is a proposal that uh, may be, or an application that may be filed by Statoa uh, for an area that uh, is east of the Kettle. Um, and it's an, in an area where uh, there's obviously um, uh, a lot of resource and a lot of resource use. But apartments, um, uh, you know, we're not here to promote wind power. Um, and frankly, we're not, at, we're not here to advocate we are here to comment through, in an indirect role, we're advocating for, for impacts because in one more direct role, we deal with it through the permitting process. We will be engaged in all of the outreach meetings that happen to make sure that the permitters, and make sure that the industry understand what the potential impacts could be. Um, but DEP, because there is a Federal Consistency Act, DEP Bank is, uh, is the lead permitter for the state of Maine. We comment through that permit process. So we will comment on impacts to the resource and impacts to the different segments of the industry. So that's that's the department's role. Um, much as we all like to think we own that bottom and we own that water, we obviously don't. So how do we how do we figure out how to ensure the least amount of impact to the resource and the resource energy? That's where the problem is. Any more questions? I have a question if I could just follow up on sure. something the governor was talking about earlier. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about the value of meat fisheries and the decline in the lobster prices over the last uh, five years or so, and things that can be done to uh, increase that price, but probably more generally increase the value of meat uh, so I think the governor mentioned approaching $500 million as a possibility, or certainly But at the same time, the governor says that the state is broke, and therefore I take it that that means that the state doesn't feel it can make investments along the lines of the Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute for the gentleman mentioned earlier. So understanding you may not have had a lot of time to get into this, I wonder if you could discuss what different marketing approaches you see the state involved in and what kind of financial resources they really think they can get into. Yeah, that's uh, a great question there. Um, there actually have been a lot of conversations about marketing in the last five or six months. Um, the Lobster Advisory Council actually 
um, deserves a lot of credit. They created a, uh, a marketing subcommittee. That subcommittee is working with the department, uh, working with the Main Laws Promotional Council to uh, figure out. The conversation has always been how do we pay for it? My comment is how do we pay for what? We don't know what we're doing, we don't know how we want to move forward. The Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute is a great model. So through this subcommittee, uh, the, uh, they have hired a gentleman by the name of John Slavik, who was very instrumental in the marketing concepts for the main blueberry uh, industry, um, which has had great success. So he is going to be uh, looking at that particular model and how it may fit into the state of Maine. Obviously, they're looking at it just from a lobster standpoint. Um, and there will be a lot of outreach meetings um, throughout the summer to talk about this whole issue. Um, this administration is supportive of that effort, but we're supportive of the marketing of all Maine seafood. Now, other segments of the industry have not been part of that conversation. So over, to, over the next course of the next year or so, we need to bring in the other segments of the industry to say, how could this particular type of model benefit you? Will it, you know, it, it's a supply and demand issue for, for lobster, maybe less so for other species because of the decline in landings, but needless to say, there is still a benefit if the price increase back to the industry and back to the owners. So those conversations are going to happen. The pain for the piece is the next question. How, how do we pay for it? There's been, you know, Dane's in here somewhere, MLPC, no offense, Dane. Three or $400,000 isn't enough. They do what they can with a very small budget. Um, we, we're talking probably millions of dollars to truly do this right. So the question then becomes, how do you pay for it? A landing surcharge? Maybe, but does that jeopardize the landings program? In the future, is it a is it a tax on just fishermen? Why should it be just fishermen? I think everybody has to participate, and there's a benefit across all segments of the coast, but also all segments of the state. So I think we need to have once we figure out the entity, we need to have a real serious conversation um, within the administration and with the legislature and with the industry on how we can protect the case. I probably don't need a mic. Everybody. One difference between Alaska and Maine, those fellows, fishermen, government, they'll tax themselves, yeah. willing to put the money out, promote yes. that product. Because you look back in the articles in the 70s, they was in the straits, same straits that we are right now. And they was willing to promote that product, put up the money. So yeah. I don't know how many people, a lot of people don't like the promotional council. They don't have no money at all to work with. You say a half a million dollars. It's nothing when you come to the world market. You go to the Boston Seafood Show, you'll see more product around the world than you'll ever see anywhere. But those countries are promoting their product. But somebody, we all got to step up and put the money up. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Linda, maybe Linda will tell us how we should market. <laughs> well, I do think that we I think our strength is in the main brand. Uh, in all our fish, our lobster, our brown fish, all of it is is especially wonderful fish. And Maine has the coast of Maine has that blessing of the unique. Uh, lobster that the world knows with claws. The message that we need to promote with this money is that this is a main product. It is not a con I mean, Canada can have their product and call it Canadian lobster, but we need to call ours main lobster and question why perhaps taxpayer dollars are going to the Lobster Institute at the University of Maine that is sponsoring conferences that unite the, 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 the fishery that they have with our fishery and they call it all Maine Lobster because it's Gulf of Maine Lobster. We have to make, I think, that distinction and have that as our vision. What are your thoughts on the University of Maine 
the Lobster Institute and the money that goes from our taxpayers to that entity. Frankly, uh, I'm going to punt a little bit because I don't have enough detail yet on, on, on the funding level. Um, the branding piece, though, that you're talking about, and the whole issue of you know, Belgium made lobster versus made lobster, I continue to hear more and more. Um, but I think you are spot on when it comes to the concept of branding Maine lobster, Maine seafood. You heard, if you heard the governor's story, um, the governor is looking at ways to find um, dollars within the state for branding. And the work that he's doing within the administration bringing all agencies together to kind of figure out how to better promote the Maine brand. The get real, get Maine concept within the state is it's taken a while, but it's great because it's grabbed um, a foothold within the market. You see that in the you don't see that necessarily with lobster. Even though it's a main lobster, you know, it ends up in Canada and goes somewhere else, and who knows what it's called. Um, but, you know, it ends up in Massachusetts. And, you know, I talked to, I was talking to uh, uh, one processor, processor, and he was saying that a lot of the lobster that goes, uh, that goes overseas is we call Boston lobster because it flies out of Boston. What the hell good is that? So, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll have to, I'll have to look into more of the options. Hello, I'm Kathy Billings, and I am actually the Associate Director at the Lobster Institute. Um, and I just want to say that the Institute does not take a stand one way or the other. We're a facilitator of communication. Uh, we have our annual Lobsterman's Town Meeting that does cross the borders between Canada and the U.S. A lot of this discussion has taken place at that town meeting, but we merely provide the venue. We are, are not an advocacy group by any stretch. We're more interested in conservation and outreach and research to maintain the health of the industry, the health of the resource. So um, I'll just share that with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Vince O'Shea, Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. I'm, I'm glad to hear you're willing to look at the ASME model when Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute. They generically market all Alaska seafood, not just salmon and not just Pacific um, processors. But what hasn't been said to rule, it's an industry-funded program. And as an example, in 2002, the Alaska Salmon Pact was worth $200 million. In 2010, it was a billion dollars. That was in the face of farm-raised salmon and the global economic shutdown to just show you the potential of a well-organized marketing program. So I'm glad to hear you're going to give that a close look. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think, uh, I think it's probably one of the best models we can look at. Uh, at the end of the day, um, that market or Louisiana or Florida, I mean, it's, it's, it's not necessarily the model. A lot of it obviously will be driven by industry and driven by staff um, and professional staff that, that know how to market and that's going to be the key. <laughs> Any other questions? And that's call for questions from the commissioner. Is Tad Miller in the room? <laughs> I got one more question. I got one more thing on marketing. Brunswick Naval Air Station closed down. Big airport. You was going to fly lobsters on it. Now that's the dealer I sell to the store. Won't happen. There's where Alaskan seafood. They fly a lot of their seafood. If you can get that product to the market, we don't care if it's China or anywhere, in 24 hours, you're going to have the best price. Yeah. And that's the Asian market right now, quality. You've got to get them highest quality they want. Yeah. You can't deliver it. You're not going to get the money. Yeah, thank you. Um, what is, is Deidre in the room? Deidre, what's that bill that uh, the committee, what's the title of that bill that we just had in front of the committee? Give me a little bit more. What are you, what are you looking for? <laughs> 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 the title of the bill in front of the committee. It's supposed to be able to read my mind. Thank you. 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 Bill that deals with uh, the ability for us to do seafood inspection and shipping. Um, 
an act to create the seafood inspection program with the environment, something like that. Um, <laughs> deals with uh, seafood inspection and the ability for, uh, potentially the ability for the state of Maine to inspect shipments, in this case lobster, uh, to expedite the permitting process associated with shipping overseas, especially in the Asian markets. Right now, <coughs> some lobster deal down east wants to, wants to ship they have a shipment that they want to go out. They call Noah. Noah starts the, the clock ticking to drive to name a town, inspect a, a load of seafood, a load of lobster that's going to go out. That inspection, no one's serious. I mean, that inspection, the cost of that inspection, the good stats, the, the basically like the meter on a taxi. That starts going up when they leave Gloucester. Come up, inspect, the time to inspect before that can be released for that shipment to fly out. We can enter into an agreement with NOAA so we can do that and save the time and money on the state and on the dealers to ensure that they would have an improved, an improved permitting process that would allow them to get product off the ground faster. Now that's an oversimplification of, of the process, but that bill, uh, the committee passed that yesterday, um, out of the Marine Resources Committee, it'll go to uh, a vote on the floor probably in the next week or two, um, and then the department will have the ability to work with NOAA to, to streamline that permitting process and take that process over. Then NOAA would have to re Basically, we would charge the dealer for a much, at a much lower rate, and then we charge Noah at a much higher rate, so we would lose any money. <laughs> so that is that's that is. Uh, conversation. The legislature directed us to look at a very specific thing, but I think the lessons learned from that are going to apply to all fisheries, not just not just law. Yeah. I, I hope so because the uh, method of entrance is vastly different as you know. Yeah, I do. Fishery to fishery. Yeah. The other thing, which I'll probably be the guy getting thrown out of the room today, but uh, when we're speaking about marketing, I know Maine has an awesome brand and I'm proud of it. But when we speak about lobsters, there's only so many pieces out there between us and Canada and whoever. And there's a lot more people out there than we have lobsters. It seems to me that it still behooves us to work with all the other entities in a close way to promote that market. Because I really, in the long run, if I can put a few extra dollars in my pocket, and I think the rest of the guys in the room, I don't care if the Canadians are putting a few in theirs too, the guys that have Massachusetts are probably good for them. So I, I, I think that must be the drive of the Senate. Anybody want to run him out of the room yet? <laughs> uh, I, I do think it's part of the conversation. Uh, I, I'm not taking that off the table, um, but I think at the end of the day it is about 
uh, it is about supply and it is about demand. Uh, with 100 million pounds of lobsters, we're certainly not going to eat them all on this day, uh, much as Linda would like us to. Uh, but uh, we, we do have um, other markets that need to be tagged. And it's how we, how we get access to those markets is the key uh, at the end of the day. My name's Brad Warren, and uh, I've never met this character here before, but it happens that uh, his question is very on point for what I do. I work on ocean acidification. I run a program on it. I started it after 25 years in the seafood industry press. When I learned about it, I thought, we got to take this on. This is our future. Uh, I am uh, from Washington State, and there, in November, we proposed, and by December 9th, the governor had approved and created a blue ribbon panel on ocean acidification. She did it because the shellfish industry, which is worth about 100 million bucks, went to bat for it, along with the tribes. You've got a shellfish industry worth about 300 million. There are things states can do. Uh, we're not local scientists. Uh, so, be happy to talk to you about this. There are going to be lessons coming out of Washington State on this because that panel is going to be digging in hard. Uh, some of the causes are local. It's not all this global pollution stuff. There's a lot of local inputs that acidify the local near shore waters, the nursery grounds where lobsters and other shellfish grow, and you can do a lot about that. So, we're going to be digging in hard on that. We're happy to share whatever we learn out there. Well, they can spend the money and we'll take the lesson learned. <laughs> Uh, just to follow up on the, uh, the seafood inspection and transportation issues. So if we're going to market that, I'm really happy to hear that, that the state's looking at doing the inspection because anything we can do to cut the cost of shipping the stuff, whether it's around the world or around the country, it's going to return more money to the fleet, you know, all the time. And, uh, make the brand more Uh, not really a loaded question, Matt, but I just wanted to um, answer a little bit to what uh, Tad had said and uh, let everybody know a little bit more about the Canadian um, bank versus Canada. Um, I know the Canadian government has invested uh, quite a bit in marketing and they are doing quite a bit now um, in overseas marketing and that is right that anything that Canada is uh, even new markets that they increase benefits everybody uh, that the fish is a lot us as well as But we do have a main label that we don't take advantage of. And the governor's example of them advertising being lost in Florida and, and serving uh, Massachusetts today is an issue. And if we can develop a main name spend money in Maine on marketing our product as a Maine product and get the traceability in, in, uh, in uh, his, uh, um, we can get a premium price being in Alaska because everybody in the United States and a lot of the countries in the world go to a market and ask for the Maine market. And if we can prove that that's what's being sold, a premium on that product. Um, so uh, I think that we need to, uh, the industry needs to take uh, advantage of this and spend some money out of their pockets and invest in uh, our, our product, which is something we don't do now. So I just want to mention that when everybody's aware. I think, you know, all of what you're hearing are all these little pieces of the puzzle, but as far as the conversations need to take place, is to develop it with the public market. Uh, it's, it's not going to happen overnight, but it's something that does
and uh, then all the funding for all the marketing that goes on inside the industry. And now I'm sure everyone has probably seen the commercials for real California cheese. Now that label belongs to the California government because the dairy is produced in California and can be used by those companies. And then you know, the government supports the label and protects it. But all the funding for marketing, for commercials, and all that stuff comes out of the industry itself. So it's also a good model to look at. In the back room. Um, uh, my name is John Nicholson from Bar Harbor, and um, uh, one of the ways to connect with China, I, I suggested that we, uh, at Hudson College this year, they had a Chinese conference trying to unite uh, educators and businessmen from Maine uh, to connect with buyers and educators from China. And um, it's worked out very well. I suggested that we create this think tank so that uh, we can have an exchange, and it's worked out very well. Now, at two of these meetings, uh, the Lobster Promotion Council was invited to come over and, uh, and say something about uh, how Maine uh, promotes lobsters and would like to work with China. And in both cases, um, they weren't present. So they had somebody speaking for them that were not from the Lobster Promotion Council. It doesn't bode well when we don't respect uh, people who are willing to trade with Maine and not in a small way, in a very big way. And the only way to raise boat prices is to create new markets. And unless we create new markets and we increase demand, even within our borders, in a more efficient way, uh, boat prices will not rise. We're going to be fishing more lobsters, and people are going to be hurting, uh, no matter how many we bring into the public. So I think that there should be a better effort into um, trying to connect with these foreign buyers. And, China in particular, Taiwan, Korea, and they're very willing to do business with us. Uh, I've been volunteering to take people by the hand and meet a few processors, a few wholesalers, dealers, and I've been doing it on my own time. And believe me, these people are receptive when you take them by the hand and you give them that personal attention. And I think that should be done a lot more and we should organize ourselves better to be able to, to cater to these buyers uh, no matter where they come from. That's a great comment, I think, uh, and, and that is the job of a promotion line at EM, uh, which I, I don't like to hear that MLPC did not come to the table for those type of meetings. That's not, uh, that's not the way uh, it, it is organized. It needs to be active and it needs to be engaged. Um, and whether it's uh, a changing of the MLPC or it's a development of a totally new entity, it's those type of meetings that uh, these groups need to participate. Thank you, Aaron Doherty with the Dallas County East Resource Center. And my question is about um, uh, monitoring on ground fish boats. <clears throat> Starting next year, the industry is going to have to pay for assay monitoring. And one of the problems that we're facing is that with um, some of the small jig fishing boats in our sector, uh, day boats lending a small amount of fish, they're going to have to pay the same uh, monitoring cost uh, per day as some of the larger boats, for example, the large dragger going on board, lending a lot more fish. And I was just wondering if there's something that do you think the state can do to address this, and what do you see as the, the state's role in leadership on this issue? Issues of consistency, obviously, uh, don't, don't go hand in hand with, uh, with the issues that we got talked about uh, as far as, as funding and costs associated with it. Um, I think it's something we probably ought to have a further conversation with uh, in state and then figure out how to address it directly with the whole. The funding issues, I mean, Federal funding issues that the states are going to face in the near term are scary as hell. Um, the first impacts to the DMR happened uh, a couple of weeks ago. We were notified that a $1.2 million annual grant that we get for salmon recreation was cut by $500,000. Um, we have a lot more of those cuts coming. Um, the ability for funding through, you know, through, uh, on the federal side for these types of programs, I'm not sure will exist, but the conversations need to happen and we can put those in the uh, my name is Craig Sproul from South Port Island, uh, Blue Bay area. We're in one of the areas in the state that definitely seeing a reduction in catch in lobsters. We just got screwed during the search season because of uh, the way the regulations and the way the season was handled. Uh, 
I personally, it cost me about $3,000 to, to go shrimping, and I even had most of the traps. The environmental impact of traps on the shrimp industry is pretty insignificant. It's not going to damage the season at all. But to restrict us, uh, anybody trapping, uh, is really a kick. And I would like to impress upon you the fact that we need a permanent season established, whether it starts January 1st and goes for three months, or the 15th of January, no matter where it is, uh, the small boat community-based fishing fleet needs that stability. You need to be able to plan, you need to be able to fish, and uh, we can't survive much longer the way this is going. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. Um, part of your question is, uh, or comment was um, how you guys got screwed. I agree. You did. Um, I think the, uh, the entire industry did um, as far as the, uh, the way the season was played out. Um, we were dealing with a situation where we didn't have a lot of shrimp to go around. We had to try to come up with the concept of uh, how we're going to manage this fishery you know, with the goal of getting the department's goal of getting a month in, at least a month in for the draft. Obviously, it didn't happen. It didn't happen because of very poor data and land data for fisheries that are uh, going to have to be micromanaged, for lack of a better term, it must be a hell of a lot more accurate and timely than it is right now. Um, and we're, we're addressing that right now with conversations with the legislature uh, and conversations with, uh, frankly, conversations with patrol uh, and DA DAOs. Uh, we were kind of, I don't want to say muddled along, but we were looking pretty good about Wednesday or Thursday the week before we closed, numbers of us. And all of a sudden, we started getting a little more land data than we were with, and then a little bit more then identifying dealers that didn't even have a license to buy. And all of a sudden, the numbers started doing this. And all of a sudden, it became an emergency action to, to stop because we were going to reach that 95% threshold. It screwed you guys, and I agree. We need to find a way to ensure that the state of Maine, and I think state by state quotas is the way to do it. The state of Maine gets our 90% share, plus who's 90 <laughs> the state of Maine gets our 90% share, and then we figure out how to split it between, the, between users, between segments of the industry. Trap is on, hit on a historic level, playing around 15%, 10 to 15%, depending on the time frame that you look at. Um, I think we could have that conversation and stay between, between the industries and figure out how we can create more certainty the industry in the future, specifically with it deals with uh, the trappers, but uh, I think it would give certainty to the dragons as well. Is there any more information on uh, the Gulf of Maine research has been uh, down at Fulton and gathering up? Uh, been taking comments from dragons and trappers. Is there, I haven't heard any more about that. Yeah, you'd have to ask them about it. I know they shared some information uh, with the department with Terry Stockwell. Uh, he's got some of those notes. Uh, um, I, I was aware that they were having the meetings, so we didn't participate in those meetings, so you have to ask them right. Any other questions? Hank, how are we doing on time? Uh, time for about one more question. There is one, then we'll break for lunch. One more question? Okay. Try one question. Thank you all very much for coming.